Good afternoon. How is everybody this afternoon? Hot? Very hot? Yeah. I already missed the rain. When it was raining, it was cool. But now, it is hot. Nevertheless, we are here, so let us take advantage of our time to study the Word of the Lord. Give me one minute to open our PowerPoint here. So this morning, I received a few questions that probably we will take time to answer some this morning and the rest probably we will do it tomorrow. Uh, we have nine questions here, but uh, I'm going to choose uh, related questions that we want to try to discuss. Uh, number one question says like this. These two questions have the same connotation. Is the SDA religion the right religion? The Seventh-day Adventist, is it the right religion? And so, what is different in your religion to my religion? I want to know. These are two separate questions, but I think are addressing to one particular question, an inquiry about what the Seventh-day Adventists are. As we all know that, if I were to answer quickly, I will just say you can find out more about the Seventh-day Adventists on the internet. Just search in Google. Maybe I don't want to do that. I just want to give a brief overview, and if you are still not, is, not satisfied, you may take time to meet me, and then we can talk a little more. Okay, so let's see. What is actually the Seventh-day Adventist Church? The Seventh-day Adventist Church is sometimes listed outside of the Christian denominations. Because they have some specific beliefs that are not in the list of doctrines or beliefs of other Christian denominations. But they share many similar beliefs, such as the one that you are reading on screen now. The SDAs believe in the six days creation, fall of mankind in the Garden of Eden, original sin, Virgin birth, the Vinito of Christ, the nature of Trinity, belief in Satan as a rebellious being, God's inspiration of the authors of the Bible, the inerrancy of scriptures, resurrection of Jesus, salvation, and others. Another list here is that we believe that God is sovereign creator. We believe in the Trinity as mentioned just now. Scriptures are inspired. Jesus Christ is God. Holy Spirit is personal being. So all of these are the same with the majority of the mainstream uh, Christian world. These are, we hold the same beliefs. What makes us different with other Christian doctrines, other Christian denominations are this. We have major differences. We believe in the spirit of prophecy. We believe that uh, Mrs. Ellen White, Ellen Gold Harmon White, is recognized as the one who received the gift of prophecy. And then it states in our beliefs that the written works of Ellen White are a continuing and authoritative source of truth, which provide for the church comfort, guidance, instruction, and correction. Okay, we believe that we have the spirit of prophecy. We also believe differently about the state of the dead. That is why we are different from other Christian denominations. Um, 
the state of the dead that is believed by other Christian denominations that there is innate immortality. That once we die, we are actually living somewhere else. Or some believe that we are already on our way to heaven. But for Adventists, we believe that the dead know nothing. That's why they are just like sleeping. Okay? That when somebody dies, they are not conscious about anything that is around them. So there's the second one that is different with other Christian denominations. And then this is also one major thing that sets SDAs apart from other Christian denominations because we believe in the investigative judgment. This is a judgment that started in 1844 and remains active in heaven today. That Jesus is going through the book of life as in Revelation 5. And then we are remnant because believe, we believe in Jesus, we keep God's commandments, and we keep the faith of Jesus and the spirit of prophecy. And then the, uh, another major difference with other churches, other Christian denominations, is because we believe in keeping the Sabbath holy. That the seventh day Sabbath is a time that God has set aside to rest from all our activities. While other Christian denominations believe that this Sabbath that is mentioned in the fourth commandment is the first day they practice what the apostles practice according to their, to their belief that the apostles practice on worshiping on the first day of the week because also Jesus was risen on the first day. And then we believe also in temperance, living a temperate life, we believe that we don't eat uh, unclean animals as outlined in Leviticus 19. That we have the freedom to eat, but uh, we are not allowed to eat certain foods that are considered unclean. And then we practice communion. For them. These are more on practices. There's communion. We practice baptism. We do not practice... Uh, Child baptism, we practice adult baptism, and that adult baptism should be by immersion, not just uh, pouring of water on the head. And uh, those are basically why we are different from other churches. If we say that we are a true, we are the true religion, I don't think that what we mean, we don't mean that we are the only ones that will be saved, no. The Seventh-day Adventists do not believe that we are the only ones that will be saved. This is why it says that in other denominations, there will be sincere people who are also going to be saved. And what is the difference of our, my religion and your religion? I think I have already stated it just now. And uh, what was the other one? Is the a SDA religion the right religion? Yeah, because we, we study the Bible, we feel that we are following God's commandments. Yes, we, we are not the only correct religion because every religion will say that they are the right religion. But biblically speaking, we practice what the Bible instructs us to do. Okay? Um, the next question is about watching movies. Is it a sin? How many of you agree that this is a sin? Raise your hands. Yeah, I only see very few. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten. How many of you believe that watching movies is not a sin? Raise your hands. Okay. Hold, hold it there. Hold it there. Hold your hands up. Okay. Put down your hands. Those are Adventists. Oh, it's more than half. <laughs> okay, let me see again. Who, who among you believe that watching a movie is not a sin? It's not wrong. It's okay. Raise your hand. Okay. Put down your hands, those who are non-Adventist. Wow. Dami. <laughs> okay. Well, you can put it down now. Now, let's, let's talk about this for a while. As I mentioned just now when I shared my experience, I felt that watching a movie is a sin. 
I was brought up in an environment that dictates that watching movie is a sin. Although I have committed that, I have watched movies in the, as, as, as what I have told you, I still believe that it is, it is not an appropriate thing to do. Okay? But it is not a measure for you to go to heaven or not. However, it is a measure of how I show my obedience to God's words. Why? Because like this. If you will go to internet, you will see statistics that say that the violence in movies is very damaging to us. But you may tell me, but sir, but we will just choose the nice movies. Tell me one nice movie that you can mention that is showing now. That, uh, that teaches you values, that has no violence, that doesn't promote sex, that doesn't promote anything that is, no, that is a, a bad influence to us. Give me one movie. What is that? Then, no, no, no. I'm, I'm referring to a movie that is being shown right now. What? What is it? Transformers. Let, let me ask you, does Transformers, does Transformers show violence? Okay. Okay, so that is disqualified. Give me another movie that doesn't... Huh? No, that is showing now. What? Smurf. Is Smurf showing now? Is this a Smurf that is blue? Okay. Those are cartoons. Okay, anyway. My point is like this. My point. Okay. Uh, let, us, let us stop uh, whispering and uh, listen to me now. My point is like this. Okay. For the Adventists, we have been taught from when we were small that watching movies is wrong because, because the place is bad. Because the people that are on that place inside the theaters are doing things that are not appropriate for Christian behavior. Okay, I think you get what I mean. We have been taught that those things are why we don't watch movies. But I think that should not be the reason why we should not be watching movies now. Why? Because if you go to SM cinemas or other cinemas now, the cinemas are good, very beautiful, very cool down inside. It is cool inside. They serve refreshments that you can buy. And inappropriate behavior is not tolerated because guards are watching you. So I think the, the reason why we should not be watching because of the place, I think that should not be valid for us now. The reason that why we should not be watching movies mainly is because of its influence in us. If you say you can watch Smurf, are you just going to watch Smurf and never watch again? No. Because once you get into it, it will be a habit and you will never stop. You, you watch Harry Potter and Deathly Hallows. What are the values that are being taught to you there? That when you have a wand, you can zap people, they can die. Or you can zap someone and they can be alive, isn't it? Is that really how you are? Can you zap someone and you can be alive? Movies will promote things that are not real. It will promote you in your mind and then maybe one day you cannot distinguish between what is real and what is wrong. So you see the influence of movies. Okay, so then you will ask me, how about watching movies at home? How about watching movies that are on TV? Yes, that one also, we have to be careful. We have to be careful. And so, I, if I were to promote that movies is good, then maybe uh, I am not in the right way, I am not in the proper position to say so. But then, it comes again to your per personal choice. If you choose to watch, then it is your choice. But the, the main point that I want to end this, my argument is like this. If you choose to watch movies with all the dangers of its influence and uh, 
and uh, other things that might happen inside the movie house, then let me please remember this. If you believe that you are a Christian and others will, will follow you, uh, look up at you because you are a Christian, especially you are a Seventh-day Adventist, and then you go to the movie theater and people's respect toward you or people's high esteem toward you is destroyed because you are watching that movie, you are watching movies, then I think you should think twice before going inside. That is what I want to tell you. If I say it is wrong, there are many arguments that say it is right. If I say it is right, there are many arguments that say it is wrong. So I just want you to keep this guideline. If you believe you are a Christian, and a Christian is supposed to exert influence to others to project that Jesus lives within your heart, do you think Jesus will sit with you in a movie house that promotes sex, that promotes uh, alcohol, that promotes cursing words? Do you think he will sit there with you? Honestly. Will he sit with you there? No. Oh. And you see, Seventh-day Adventist Church is not the only denomination that promotes that watching movies is, is harmful for your spiritual life. Other Christian denominations also promotes that. If you go around, you will find out that other den Christian denominations, even here in the Philippines, tell their church members, don't watch movies because of the reasons that I have mentioned to you. So it is your personal choice. Edward once asked me, Papa, can you bring me to the movie? And I didn't want to argue with him, and I told him, Edward, what did I tell you? You are a pastor's son. You cannot watch movies. And then you know what he answered? He said, Papa, but some of my friends in AJA, they are pastor's children, and their papa, their pastor, father, bring them to the movie house. So what will I do? What will I answer to him? So I gave him the same explanation that I gave to you. It is your choice. If other cultures believe it is nothing wrong, their moral values dictate that it is all right, then it is their choice. But for me, I gave my choice to Edward, to my family. And for you, you take your choice. If you believe you, you can still become a true Christian that finds your identity in Christ by watching, by going there, it is your choice. Okay? If you want to argue with me, you can argue with me in the office. Thank you. Okay. So, the passage in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31 says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do it for the glory of God. Okay. So, there are other questions here, but if we keep on answering questions, then we will not finish our uh, session this afternoon. I'm going to answer the other questions tomorrow. Okay. So, we are going to talk about Christ in my social life. Before we proceed, shall we bow our heads for prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you that uh, we are stimulated by our lessons, that we are stimulated to find out, to dig deeper into the issues that we have uh, brought up so that we can live a life that can be identified with Christ. And so this afternoon, as we continue our study, we are going to study how we can become good friends in our social interaction with others. We ask for the Holy Spirit to come upon us to guide us and help us understand. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. During his days as president, Thomas Jefferson and a group of companions were traveling across the country on a horseback. They finally reached a river which had left its banks because of a recent downpour. So it was flooding. The swollen river has washed the bridge away. And so each rider was forced to go on the river on a horseback, fighting for his life to cross the river. The very real possibility of death threatened each driver, each rider, which caused a traveler who was not part of their group to step aside and watch the others cross. 
After several has plunged into the river and started their perilous journey across the river, the stranger came to President Jefferson. And then he asked President Jefferson to carry him across the river. The president agreed without hesitation. And so the men climbed on and they crossed. After making it safely to the other side, the stranger slid off the back of the saddle onto dry ground. And then one of President Jefferson's companion asked him, Tell me, tell me why did you select the president to ask this favor of? The man was shocked, admitting that he had no idea it was the president who had helped him. And he said, all I know is that on some of your faces was written the answer no, and some of them was the answer yes. His was a yes face. His was a yes face. This is talking about our social interaction with others. This is beautifully illustrated in Matthew 9, verses 10 to 13. This tells the story of Jesus having dinner at Matthew's house. Many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. So here, Jesus gave a good example that we should be friends to everyone, whether these friends, that these people that we are making friends with, whether they know Jesus or not, whether they are sinners or they are like saints. But we should not, we should not limit our relationship to the people that we already call friends. This is the main idea that we want. However, there are some passages in the Bible that will instruct us how to choose the people that we will interact with. When we talk about social relationship, this is something that cannot be removed from humans. Humans are social beings. Humans are social beings. And so you see, because of the social being, there is always a need to interact with somebody else. What will happen to you if from your classroom, you are requested by your teacher to leave the classroom, and then she will ask you to go inside a small room which is dark and you are alone? What will happen to you in the first five minutes? Maybe you will be okay. How about after 30 minutes? You will not be okay. Why? Why won't you be okay? Because you, you start to feel lonely. There's nobody else in that room except you and the chair and the darkness. What will happen after one hour? You will feel like you will, you will become crazy. And if that goes on for the whole period, that means the teacher is very cruel. But I don't know, I, don't, I hope that we do not do this kind of punishment. But this kind of punishments usually are very, are very useful in dealing with people who cannot comply. This is being applied to prisoners, to inmates in the jail systems if they commit a very big uh, a very big uh, crime within their community in the prison, they will be put into isolation, sometimes for one day, sometimes for one week. And so humans are social beings. We need to interact with other people. Wikipedia defines social interaction as a relationship between two, three, or more individuals. Social relations derived from individual agency, form the basis of social nature. Now, 
you will understand why you cannot help it if you do not talk to your friend on the side. Yeah? Because you are social creatures, you desire to interact. And this is an interaction between two, three, or more people. And in many ways, Jesus always, always took the chance to promote a healthy social relationship to his disciples. Jesus, in fact, was probably a behaviorist. He was concerned with our behavior as manifested in our relationship to God and to others. Whenever Jesus commands his disciples to love, the word agape is used. The word agape is described is to describe God's attitude toward Jesus as well as his attitude towards human race. And this type of love is expected of Jesus' followers towards other people as well. There is a quotation from Hog and Vine. Hog and Vine writes about this. Christian love. Christian love, whether exercised to our brethren or toward men generally, is not an impulse from the feelings. It does not always run with the natural inclination, nor does it spend itself only upon those for whom some affinity is discovered. Love seeks the welfare of all. Romans 15 verse 2. And works no ill to any. Romans 13 verses 8 to 10. Love seeks opportunity to do good to all men. And especially toward them that are of the household of faith. Galatians 6 verse 10. So you see Jesus is always asking us to show mercy and compassion that is agape in our social relationships. Your feelings and desires at that given moment are irrelevant. What is relevant there is your mercy, your act of mercy and compassion. And so, this brings us to the question, if we are to show compassion and love to others in our social life, how can it be done? How can it be done? For me, I still feel that if in a social relationship, it has to be a face-to-face -face relationship. It has to be a face-to-face -face relationship. That is why when you are making friends in Facebook, who will you approve first? Is it your friend that you know, that you play with? Or is it someone that is still a stranger to you? Which one will you approve first on a friend request? A friend, of course, that you already know. But after that, you will give considerations to make friends with others that you do not know yet. When I first opened my Facebook, of course I had no friend. No? Of course, you just opened it. When I opened my Facebook account, I had no friend. And then I said, I want to make as many friends as I can. After one day opening my Facebook, I add a friend. Add and add. All these friends that I know from my child, I add and add and add. After two days, I already had 150 friends. Oh, after that, my friend started suggesting a friend, suggesting a friend. I approve, 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 approve. And you know, almost one year later, my Facebook account is already full. 4,999 friends. Out of all those friends, the one that I really know as my friend, maybe only 500. The 4,500, I don't know. But this is social networking in a sense now. That is why my question now, if you are in Facebook, you are in Multiply or you are in other, in Friendster, how can the definition that we are talking about, that Jesus is saying to show love, to show affection, to show sympathy to others, 
Do you think it is very proper, we can properly do it in social networks? No, yes. Because we don't have social immediate interaction. But maybe in other ways we can. We can show how we care through the posts and everything. But the essence of what Jesus is trying to say here could never be accomplished if we are only in a virtual world. And so this afternoon, I want to share with us, because this is very important. Jesus showed that he, will, he is willing to eat with his sinners, with others that other people considered sinners. He is willing to eat with them. He is willing to have a social relationship with them. And then, furthermore, he always tells his disciples to love one another, to love others. And so it is very important that we should also follow this example because we are Christ's followers. And so the first thing that we have to do is to look, to choose for your friends carefully. Yes, of course, we want to show love to others. We want to show love to others, but we need to choose our friends carefully. We need to choose our friends carefully. We will see that in Proverbs 12, verse 26, it says, The righteous should choose his friends carefully, for the way of the wicked leads them astray. This verse should be literally be burned into your memory banks. So that when you choose friends, choose friends that will make good influence upon you. I know in our age, we are many times, we are many times faced with peer pressure. Maybe some of our friends who are older than us, who are more experienced than us, they will, they will ask us to join their network of friends. And probably these friends, are not good influence to you. Maybe they want to take advantage of you. Maybe because they notice that you have a lot of uh, money given by your mom and dad every morning. Oh, and then your friends notice, oh, maraming pera pala to. Especially if you are new, no? you are new in the school. And they will say, oh, magkaibigan na tayo. Bili ka muna ng C2. Oh, bili ka muna ng C4. Ah, sorry. Is there a C4? C2. Oh, C4. Sorry. Anyway, something to drink. Buy us something to drink. They take advantage of you. Or they give you bad influence. They say, oh, let's go at the back of the gym. Oh, ano meron dyan? Meron ako dito, oh. Not cell phone, something else. We will ask you to go there and you will say, sige, try mo. It's okay. Just like what I did alone with the you remember my story about the, when I tried that cigarette? Those are bad influence. Friends that give bad influence. Therefore, you have to choose your friends carefully. And then we see that there are benefits in choosing good, godly friends. Proverbs eleven fourteen says, Where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors there are safety. That is why you need to good cho you choose good friends. Do not choose friends that will inspire you to become bad. Become bad. There is another one. The third one. He says that as iron sharpens iron. It is fascinating that when two people interact, they can be like iron sharpening another iron a true friend that gives you good influence that is a godly friend can keep you sharp in the spirit he can always he or she can always remind you that you are already not on the right track you are already going off track so it is like iron and iron sharpening as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Proverbs 27, verse 17. And then another is that 
Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness and do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God. However, I want to just point out something in, in this passage. Maybe most of you will be thinking, if Jesus said that we should mingle with others who are sinners, then why is this passage saying this? Of course, I am not trying to promote that you will be exclusive only to friends that are maybe your church mates or maybe because your classmate. But because of the other warnings, you have to choose good friends. The idea of being unequally yoked with unbelievers are those people whom, who has already known the truth but is not practicing the truth. That means they do not believe. And this is what I want to define here as unbelievers. They know what is the truth but they do not want to practice the truth. So stay away from them because they, instead of you becoming good influence to them, you may be deceived by them. And so these points will help us to make good friends, to give a positive influence to others, to have a good social relationship with others. And next, I want to share with you some tips on how to become a good friend. When you want to become a good friend, you have to lose judgment. You should not be judgmental. Do you agree with this? Would you like to have a friend that always judge you? No. Okay. Do not be judgmental. Friends see each other with no judgment. This does not mean that you are going to like all your, of your friend's choices. However, there is a way to share your opinion without being judgmental. Okay? Try to find out more information about why your friend is making certain judgments and help them to come up on the right track. Number two is we have to be honest. Are you an honest person? Good. Honesty is very important trait of a true friend. Friends trust each other to help them in difficult situations. One day there was uh, there were there were two good friends. There were two good friends. They were walking in the woods. They were walking in the woods. And then they took off their shoes because they said, Wow, in the city we never touch the grass. We want to touch the grass. So they were walking on the grass and suddenly out of nowhere came a tiger. And then the, other, the friend number one said, Look, there's a tiger. Friend number two said, What are we going to do? Suddenly, friend number one sat down and started putting on his socks. And finally, he put on his shoes. And friend number two said, You cannot outrun the tiger by putting on your shoes. And said, No, I just want to outrun you. They cannot outrun the tiger, but friend number one put on the shoes to make sure that he can at least outrun friend number two. In case the tiger hits them, at least his friend will be the first one to be eaten. Be, be a good friend. If you are a friend, you have to be honest to your friend. Being dishonest destroys people and it destroys friendships. Number three is you have to listen. Listening to your friends can help you grow closer. And listening in this sense is also sharing, lending an ear. Lending an ear. Sometimes when we have friends, we take them for granted. They might have tried to look for opportunities to tell us, I want to talk to you about something. 
But maybe you say, oh no, let's just go here, let's just do this. You fail to listen to what they want to say. And then you lose the opportunity to help your friend. Listening is very different from hearing. You need not to only hear what the other person is saying. You will need to offer feedback and assurance that you actually understand what your friend is saying. So be a good listener. The next one is, to be a good friend, you have to give rather than take. In my explanation just now, when we take advantage of someone, we are always taking. We never give. That is why that cannot become a true friend. It cannot become a good friend. The Bible even says it is better to give than to receive. We have to find ways to give your friend and expect nothing in return. Giving is more than just buying presents. You can give your time and your help. You can intercede in prayer for your friend or even to help with homework. But not to give your homework to be copied. No. Help does not mean that. And the next one is, have fun with your friend. Friends need to have fun with one another. Make sure you are doing things you both like and laugh together and enjoy those times together. You know, there was an ex my experience when I was, when I was in uh, grade 7 or grade 8. Grade 7 is first year high school. I grew up in a campus just like AUP and then I, I made friends with a teacher who is still single. My, my friend, his name is Benya, this teacher, his name is Benya. Together with my friend David, we always play with him. We hang out in his house. Since he is a professor, he has one house for himself. He has a TV, we watch TV. We like to do things together. And then one day, he was asleep in the sofa. And when he sleeps, he opens his mouth like this. And then my friend David had a crazy idea. He said, you want to have fun? I said, of course. Look, look, he's sleeping. I said, why? Let's do something. Let's go fishing. What do you mean? Come, come, come. So he went to his house. He looked for salt, a rock of salt like this big. He got a yarn and said, let's go fishing. Where? To Benya. So we opened again Benya's door, and then we got the yarn, and then he said, do like this, huh? Do like this. So he slowly put the rock of salt closer and closer, and it reached Benya's mouth. And as soon as he felt the, the salt, he went again. Oh, we were having fun. We were having fun. <laughs> And then he pulled it out quickly before Benya can even lick the salt. He was fast asleep. He put the check. You want to try? I said, of course, of course, I want to try. So I got, I got, I got the yarn and I put it down slowly. And then as soon as it reaches mouth, he would go. And then he finally woke up. As soon as he woke up, he realized what we were doing. He reached for his shoes and he hit me with his shoes. You know where my friend David was? He was already at the door. I followed him. We ran out of the house never to come back. And that was the last time we had fun with David, with our friend Benya. It was not fun anymore. I lost that friend. After a while, he left the university we went to boarding school and we never had contact anymore. I lost that friend for the sake of having fun. And so the fun that we mean here is not having fun that will put you at risk to lose other friends. Okay? Maybe you like to have fun by bullying your friends. That is not fun. That is not fun. Have fun in a positive way. Learn to compromise. The next one. Learn to compromise. Everyone has different interests, likes, and dislikes. And friends do not always agree with each other. But when this kind of divisions is 
in our midst, we have to learn to compromise in a way to give in. At this time, you give in. The next time, he will give in. So you will continue having a beautiful friendship with each other. The next one is trust your friend. While it is important to be honest and to compromise with your friend, it is also important to have trust in your friend. I remember another experience. When, I, when we were small, we were crossing, me and my friends, we, we, have, we had a, what do you call this? An air, air gun, you know? It has small pellets. We used to shoot uh, uh, quails, quails. We go out in the woods, we used to shoot quails with the air gun. So there were four of us, and then I told them, I think it is not good, it is not good for us to pass this way. No, you trust me. We have a gun. If somebody, we will point it and they will run away. Oh, I said, this bad friend is bad. But we passed, we passed a fish pond. And on the fish pond, there was a man guarding the fish pond. And the man told me, hey, this, you are not allowed to pass here. This is private property. And then my friend holding the gun said, well, we are just passing. We didn't know that the previous night, there were thieves who came to the fish pond and stole all the tilapia in the fish pond. So this man who was guarding is very suspicious of everyone, especially we are holding a shot, uh, 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 air gun. So he shouted at us the second time. And I told my friend, come, let's go back. And our other friend said, yeah, let's go back. But since the friend holding the gun was the biggest, he said, no, let's continue. We continued. And then the man shouted for the third time. I said, you sh cannot pass this way. He came down from his uh, hut carrying a bolo and started running after us. When I look at the bolo, oh, I ran. I saw all my friends also already away ahead of me. I started running and running and running. There were bushes I just ran through. Finally, I realized I was already lost. And I, I was still afraid because the man was still, was still running after me. What a friend I had in that friend. They left me. And then when he, at the beginning, he said, trust me. Be supportive is the next one. Sometimes a friend just needs a shoulder to cry on or a cheer from the audience. I am glad you are supportive to our friend just now who sang. That was my first time to see you clap. Yeah? Why did you clap? Very good. You wanted to support him. Although I think we are not allowed to clap in this church. But anyway, be supportive. When your friend says he or she is running for office, for example, in the student government, show him your support. Show her your support. When your friend is crying after her boyfriend broke up with her, be the shoulder for her to cry on. Okay? And then the next one is to empathize. Many Christian young, young Christians confuse by being sympathetic and being empathetic. You know, there's a difference between this. Being empathetic means that you are able to put yourself in the other person's shoes. When your friends needs your support, you need to, treat, to see their situation before their eyes. You need to, to look at it as if what will happen if I experience it? Show empathy. The next one is to show touch. Touch. If you, if you ever get a chance to, to go to National Bookstore, you will find there a book called The Five Languages of Love. It is written by Gary Chapman. And one of the five languages of love is the language of touch. Touch is a valuable tool in growing a friendship, yet it is often overlooked. Touch is important in that it creates a bond between you and your friend. A good way to use touch is to put your hand on a friend's shoulder in support or giving your friend a hug in greeting. I have seen that 
many times in our in our surrounding here you touch your friend when you meet you hug that is very nice that is a proper way of using this to develop a good friendship and then the last one is to share your feelings opening yourself up to another person is a part of growing your friendship learn to share how you feel even if you think it will cause some confrontation friends need to be able to share their feelings without judgment if you are not able to share your feelings with your friends then you will keep the friendship from growing into a great relationship and so my dear friends our time is already up it is very important to develop a good social relationship with your friends on top of that it is also important that you choose good friends on the other hand you should always take time to show good influence to others that you feel may see Jesus in your life as you strive to change their attitude if they are not yet a good friend you strive to change their attitude by showing a good influence to them indeed the Bible says that we have to keep away from them but on the other hand when Jesus said that we should show love we should also try to do that if your love efforts to your friends whom you want to change does not work then that is the time you will stay away from them but as much as possible let us try to be good friends and develop all this in our daily life because Jesus commanded us to love one another John 15 verses 12 to 17 this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you greater love has no one than this that one lay down his life for his friends you are my friends if you do what I command you no longer do I call you slaves for the slave does not know what his master is doing but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father I have made known to you you did not choose me but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask from the father in my name he may give to you let us strive to make a good influence to our friends and let us develop that influence with love as we follow what Jesus wants us to do. My dear friends, this afternoon, this is Thursday. Tomorrow will be Friday, and by tomorrow, we will only have three meetings left. On Sabbath, we will close. This afternoon, we have studied all of this. All our topics have helped us to understand more how we can be identified as Christians, how we can be identified as Christ followers. There is an urgent need for us to respond to our lessons so that we may be able we may be able to show a life that is obedient to God. Some of us may have already made Jesus as our friend indeed, as our friend and has accepted Jesus as our personal Savior through baptism. But some of us maybe has been thinking about this some of us have been thinking about making Jesus as our friend, to identify ourselves as Christians, but is still on the valley of decision. And so this afternoon, before we end our session, I want to ask you 
If there are any among you who are in the valley of decision in making, in taking this step to accept Jesus as your personal Savior and wants to be baptized because you want to be identified as Christ's followers, to do all these things, to be a good influence, to make a social influence, to make good friends, to show love to others, to show a good outward, outward appearance. I want you to stand for you who wants to make that decision. Thank you. Thank you. You are sitting down again. For those of you who have thought about this, maybe when you were still in the elementary, you have wanted to take this step. I want to accept Jesus as my personal Savior. I want to be baptized. But then something made you forget about that idea. And maybe some of you, when you came into high school the first year, you wanted to be baptized. You want to accept Jesus as your personal Savior. But then one thing led to another. You became very busy in your life. You were in second year. You forgot about it. Third year, you keep on forgetting. And so now is another opportunity for you. If you feel that you want to make this decision, you want to be baptized, I want you to stand. I want you to stand. Are there any of you who wants to make this decision? Thank you. I see three young men at the back. We have two, another here in front. We have three girls. We have one, we have two. If you are willing to make this decision, your friends are showing support to you. They are happy because you are making this decision. If you want to make this decision, I want you to step forward in here because we want to pray for you this afternoon. Please don't be embarrassed. These are your friends, remember? Your friends want to support you in your decisions. I want you to come here and I want to pray for you because you want to make decision to accept Jesus as your personal Savior. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Yes, I invite the others to come forward. Yes. Maybe some of you are still thinking, what is your question again, Pastor? I want to tell it to you one more time. Maybe there was a point in your life that you have, that you have decided that Yes, this is what I want to be. I want to become a Christian. I want to become a follower of Christ. But then you forgot about it. And nobody reminded you about it. Now I am reminding you again. This is an opportunity for you. If you want to accept Jesus as your personal Savior through baptism, I want you to come forward. I want to pray for you. Because Jesus has shown us that He loves us and He wants us to show love to others. Therefore, we will respond by showing this, by accepting Him, by accepting His love and the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Thank you, my young friends. You have come forward. You have indicated your willingness to accept Jesus as your personal Savior. And so along with your friends, I want to pray for you. May I request our friends who are on their seats to please stand up as we pray for our friends up here in front and for ourselves individually. Okay? Let us bow our heads for prayers.
Father in heaven, here we are, sinners. Throughout this week, we have studied many things. We have explored things that will help us to understand our identity as young people. And we don't want to find that identity in other places. But we want to find our identity in you. Because you are our creator. You have created us. And you have many beautiful plans for us. As young people, we are continually growing every day. And we are learning many new things every day through this series of Week of Prayer. We have found that indeed, we can find our identity in you. Because we are Christians. We are followers of Christ. I thank you that this afternoon, in response to your love for each one of us, our friends have come up to respond to my call for baptism. Yes, I believe my friends here, they have taken, they have thought and pondered about this decision before. But maybe they have forgotten about it because nobody reminded them about it. At one point in life, they have wanted to be baptized, but they keep on holding it on. And I am thankful that they have taken this opportunity to come forward, to show their friends that, yes, I want to be identified as Christ's follower, and I want to accept Jesus as my personal Savior. I pray that you will bless their decisions now, dear Father. Ground it in their hearts that, that their decision that they have made now, they have shown it to others. They are not ashamed to admit that they want to accept you as their personal Savior. Bless them now, dear Father. Give them the Holy Spirit. Help them. As we continue our last day tomorrow, I pray that you will continue to inspire our other friends who may still be in the valley of decision. Thank you once again, dear Father, for you are always showing your love for us. And thank you because Jesus has died on the cross for us to make salvation possible. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. So, thank you, thank you. Please, may I ask you to please remain after this on the left side over there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.